Good morning. My name is Alfred Gosner. I'm an economist and also a philosopher by training. I work mainly in Germany and I'm currently on the executive board of Fraunhofer, which is Europe's largest contract research organization. I'm also a extraordinary professor at Stellenbosch University, more precisely at the Business School of Stellenbosch University. I'm here this morning within the Leaders Angle series of USB and I will give a presentation on the subject the Euro crisis, causes and implications for South Africa. I have a subject today for you which uh, might look remote from an African perspective, sort of the Europeans have a luxury problem and uh, they should solve it themselves, but it's not that remote. You will uh, uh, hear that, uh, you know, the Euro crisis is a very big crisis, much bigger, I think, than many people at the surface think, and it uh, may, depending on its further outcome, very much in fact, uh, affect the world economy and uh, also South Africa, given your many close relationships. The crisis really developed originally from a local banking crisis in the U.S. The American home loans, which are really an American issue, turned into an international banking crisis because a lot of those loans were repackaged into structured assets, asset-backed securities, which were sold internationally. And therefore, the problem of the home loans, that means many people not being able to pay back those loans, uh, was transferred into those countries where banks had bought those structured assets. So uh, a number of banks in Europe were affected, and some were affected so badly that they had to be rescued by their governments. And therefore, out of a, what, what looked like a banking crisis, you had eventually a sovereign debt crisis of those countries which had to bail out large banks. Increasingly, we noticed that the eurozone is not an optimum currency zone. The differences in economic productivity and performance were enormous before, and they are still enormous. The second was that it also started, uh, or and is still, with a, a quite faulty mechanism to settle balance of payments problems. And that has to do with the fact how, if such a difference between, uh, in the balance of payments between the countries arise, how you settle that between the different countries. The crisis, therefore, is firstly a fundamental economic and state debt crisis of a number of Euro countries, and it concerns most notably Greece, Spain, Portugal, Italy, Ireland, and Cyprus. And Cyprus and Greece are, of course, the smaller cases, which would not sort of jeopardize the whole system. But Italy and Spain are of a different caliber. If you look at those crisis countries, you see a number of common features but you also see individual differences. Most of them have relatively high public debt levels. You see here the public debt, government debt to GDP ratio uh, in 2012 and percentages, and you see them in terms of size, and uh, you see the average of the Eurozone is around 90%. The EU27, very similar, because the EU27, while it's more states, it's, it's uh, a few small states, which you can add on. The big ones are all in the Eurozone as well. So, yeah, Greece is leading with 153%. Before Italy, 127, Ireland, 117, Portugal, 120. Spain is still fairly low here because they started with around 40%, but they have added in the last few years a dramatic figure, so they are now at around 77 The crisis countries are therefore, to different degrees, in danger of state bankruptcy, accompanied by and leading probably to bankruptcy of banks, of many other firms and private individuals. It is worth noting, you know, that state bankruptcy is technically avoidable as long as you have your own central bank because you can, in principle, print money, and uh, as long as somebody is prepared to take that money, you avoid state bankruptcy. Because of the close economic ties regarding trade and investment between the Eurozone countries and between the other Euro countries, and, of course, between those countries and the rest of the world economy, an economic collapse in larger countries such as Italy and Spain would not only affect severely the other European economies, but finally also the global economy. And that's why the euro crisis is potentially also a world economic crisis. Let me come back to that one aspect which I mentioned already as being important, and that's the difference in competitiveness and balance of payments issues. You see the current account balances 
uh, in the European Monetary Union, you see what they call the core countries, which is really uh, Germany, France, and uh, the north, and you see the periphery on the southern side, and uh, I think uh, you see the differences here, which speak for themselves. The introduction of the euro currency in 2000 brought low interest rates for its members. That means it invited the countries to increase their debt to finance artificial booms, for example, a building boom in Spain, and, of course, to distribute many social goodies in some countries. Prices and wages in those countries after introduction of the euro rose much faster than in the rest of the EU and the OECD. And the old mechanism, the currency devaluating, was no longer available. Thus, prices and wages now would have to redo what happened in the last 10 years, you know. Or, alternatively, a country like Germany should inflate. In the failure of regulating financial systems properly, we have now discovered that European banks, on average, have too little shareholder funds in the bank balance sheets and huge leverage ratios. We have asymmetric incentives in banks. It means the, the, the managers make money uh, if it goes up, but they don't lose money if it goes down. The total sum of all credits of euro states and of the European Central Bank for the six crisis countries I mentioned, Greece, Ireland, Italy, Portugal, Spain, and Cyprus, amounts, meanwhile, to 1,515, that's this figure, billion euros. That's quite a number. What you also have in those figures is about 200 million of money which the ECB paid out already by buying up government bonds. That means the European Central Bank is already doing something which, European, which central banks normally do not do and should not do, and that's monetizing government debt. At the moment, they buy secondary paper, paper which is already on the market, but of course, you can say in a country like Italy or so, you, you can issue new government debt, you tell the local banks to take it up, and uh, the ECB uh, issues to those banks uh, a few hundred billion euros, which they do regularly, and thereby eventually they end up with the ECB. Solutions of the euro crisis. There have been two basic schools of thought. The first is what I call joint rescue facilities, and that's the model we are in. That means the euro countries come together and collectively devise instruments which they offer on certain conditions to those countries who need it. The second thought which belongs to that concept is you develop the original euro system forward in the sense of a more integrated financial system of an integrated fi fiscal and monetary policy. There is two sub-solutions really here. This is what basically all the southern countries want. That means full unlimited guarantee by the euro countries and the ECB. And this is effectively what President Draghi almost has said. And that's the second school which says, yes, we keep those rescue facilities, we even increase them, but only under stringent requirements for each individual countries. That means we accept in principle that it may fail. We accept that individual countries may have to leave the euro. That's a position which increasingly, I think, the German government is putting up, and that's under the pressure of our electorate. The other basic solution, called the restructure the currency system approach, and it means essentially that weak economies should be encouraged to leave the eurozone. That doesn't mean they shouldn't get money. The basic argument is, is if you are outside the euro system, then you can devalue your currency. That means then you don't have to get your wages and prices down as if you are in the eurozone. Okay, that's my summing up the part so far. The crisis is not over. The economic prospects in Europe, I think, are likely to worsen. Optimum consolidation, I mentioned it just, is ill-defined. There's no clear yardstick. Real adjustments, and that's also a fact, have hardly begun. The real question is how do we rebuild trust in the financial system, financial system in a wide sense, not only financial markets but also governments, and who will provide trust? Greece may still be the first state. I, I think that's been accepted meanwhile, although it's not being discussed right now. France's economic development, I think, is decisive and is seen critical. They have been downgraded by the rating agencies. I think the crisis will continue for a long period of time, and that is, in a sense, even good, because the necessary real adjustments inside and outside the Eurozone will take a lot of time. Okay, lessons and implications for South Africa. I think 
that in a sense that can be taken quite short. The relationship, the impacts of the Eurogrise on South Africa will essentially run through those five sort of channels. South Africa had weathered the 1990 Asian crisis quite well, and it seemed very resilient to external shocks. But it ended the global financial crisis 2008 with a greater degree of vulnerability. It had a fairly large current account deficit, it had high interest rates, reasonably high inflation, and it was hit quite severely. South Africa ended the recession in May 2009, the first time, the first recession in 17 years. During this time, about 1 million workers in South Africa lost their jobs, according to official statistics. The unemployment rate went to 24.5%, whatever it is worth. I think there's still a big debate what the real unemployment in the country might be. The Johannesburg Stock Exchange lost almost 45% from May 2008 to November 2008. New listings remained subdued, and essentially you could say this was all associated with the global flight from risky assets. Net portfolio uh, of, of net other flows, and that helped to offset the situation. You see here, foreign direct investment, that is, yeah, this one, that is still positive. You see net portfolio, that is that part, that's quite negative, and you see net other, that was that part. And that helped essentially to buffer the economy in 2008. If you look at the importance of those channels regarding your interdependencies with the EU countries, then you see that those interdependencies are quite large. This is European statistics, and it shows from the European perspective imports and exports to South Africa. And you see these are imports into the euro system. So these are your exports. And you see they have only gone up very moderately. And these are your imports from the eurozone countries, and they have continue to go up, and that's the resulting deficit. Let us look at the commodity price channel. South Africa's commodity exports account for about 60% of your merchandise exports and 14% of your GDP, and about 32% are, again, for the EU countries, and 15% are for China. And clearly, any European recession would immediately be translated into a reduced demand for those commodities and would have an effect. So I think we can really come to the conclusion. The well-developed economic relationships, especially with the EU and the Eurozone countries, which have undoubtedly benefited South Africa in the past, would, of course, turn correspondingly into problem areas in the case of a worsening of the Euro crisis. If you look at what you can do at defensive strategies, one thing is you should diversify your trade relations more. You should look for getting broadly diversified, have more trade, of course, with Africa, with Latin America, with Asia. One should certainly ask oneself, what are the conditions to get foreign direct investment up? That means long-term investment into real investments, into real projects in the country, rather than short-term portfolio investment. The bank banking system, I don't think you have a major issue. I think you are, as I already mentioned, quite ahead in terms of prudent regulation. Commodity prices, that's another issue, and I think it's being uh, already addressed by the country. I think you must get increasingly in a situation where you not just export commodities, but where you increase the beneficiation amount of your commodities and do more in the country with it. And I want to sum it up with that. Europe has been, and it is an important partner for the development of South Africa. And I think that will continue, and I think also it should continue. But... I think we must note Europe is not just in the middle. I think maybe more at the beginning of a major and long-term economic crisis which might affect any of its major economic partners and therefore South Africa as well. And in that regard, I think uh, reducing your interdependence to some extent where possible and creating sort of offsetting measures and plans might be an advice uh, not an advice which solves all the problems. I think uh, being part of the world economy, you know, you are part for the better and for the worst parts. And I think with that, I want to finish my talk. Thank you.